So thank you everyone for joining. For those that are just getting on, if you would take a moment, if you have access to the chat, if you could just say where you're from and uh, how you have seen opioid overdose, overdoses affect your community. We like to know who's in the room, um, so to speak. So it's always helpful to know where people are coming from location-wise. So Red Wing, Illinois, Fergus Falls, Racine, this is great, Duluth, Mille Lacs. Milford. Thank you for sharing your stories too in the chat. So sorry for your loss. Okay, Stuartville. New York, Suffolk, South, Suffolk County. I'm probably not saying that right, <laughs> Moorhead. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, just with, I want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, Laura, would you? So, my name is Mary Jo Catras, and I am with University of Minnesota Extension. Um, and along with my colleague, Laura Poblambi, we are part of the Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center that is funded under SAMHSA. And we are part of a multi state project um, that includes um, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Um, and we are all part of. Um, our opioid work in helping to um, provide technical assistance and training and education across this region um, and area of the, of the United States. My name is Laura Palumbi and I'm a pharmacist. I work at the College of Pharmacy in Duluth. I'm also a graduate of the College of Pharmacy in Duluth and I've been fortunate to be doing this work for a while now. Um, and I just want to, before we get started, um, acknowledge that our words very much matter. You'll notice in this presentation and others that we really strive to use person first language um, and to really use non stigmatizing language um, because we know that stigma contributes to substance use disorder and also people not getting help for their substance use disorder. So um, I also want to acknowledge that this can be a very difficult um, presentation and topic for those of us that have been impacted very personally by substance use or perhaps by opioid use. Um, very commonly, we have folks joining these meetings that have lost a loved one to opioid overdose. So if that is you, uh, we just want you to know that our hearts are with you and that's why we do this work because um, it's so important that we don't lose any more lives and these are preventable um, deaths. So um, I hope we can all work together to do this work to really support people in um, prevention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and all of those things. And think about the words we use and just being an approachable person by using those words um, so we can help people get help if they need it. So um, today's uh, ob objectives are to look at the factors that could increase a person's risk of overdose, um, signs and symptoms of opioid toxicity. Um, we're going to look at pros and cons of different formulations of naloxone. Naloxone is the generic name for Narcan. So um, that's the drug we're talking about. Um, resources to access naloxone and legal considerations. Um, so again, before we um, get started, it's really important for us to take a step back and just um, try to be a little more self-aware um, and think about how our personal beliefs can lead to biases. Um, I'll do, use myself as an example. Uh, I grew up in a household with substance use and um, alcoholism specifically, and I found that I had a very negative view of people that struggled with alcohol use disorder. And I had to work through that as an adult so that I could be effective in my role and realized um, that my experience was not um, consistent with everybody's experiences. And there are, um, there's hope for people, there's recovery. And so really thinking about how our interactions with people that have a substance use disorder have impacted us personally, um, what biases we might have. All of us have biases. That's just a part of being human. So the most important thing is to really think about them and um, be aware of them and then act on them. 
and really kind of taking a step back and realizing that most people want and value the same things in life, a family, a home, control over their circumstances, social acceptance, um, being appreciated and loved, friends, but because of their substance use disorder, these things um, can disappear from their life um, and really trying to appreciate their life before the need for intervention. So as I mentioned before, we really strive to use person first language, anti-stigmatizing um, language because there's enough stigma around substance use. Um, so we talk about a person with an opioid use disorder um, or a person with a substance use disorder not an addict, not a junkie. We never use those words. Um, if somebody in recovery wants to identify as an addict, like that is definitely, if that's a part of their recovery, that's of course acceptable. But as um, community members, we try to avoid those pieces of language because um, they can contribute to stigma um, and judgment. So here's some other um, terms too. So neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal symptom instead of addicted babies. Um, medications for addiction treatment or medications for opioid use disorder, um, those are preferred terms instead of MAT or medication assisted treatment. Um, and that's because we want to recognize that all conditions um, might need treatment like drugs for them. And so when we say medication assisted treatment, we make it sound like the norm is to do it without medications. And that can also be stigmatizing. We have drugs that help people um, with opioid use disorder. Um, also thinking about terms like positive and negative instead of um, clean and dirty or unexpected versus expected. I was a member of a treatment court team for a while, so um, it was kind of tricky, I think, because we're used to saying clean and dirty for drug screens, um, but really using positive and negative is preferred to avoid um, assigning the word dirty to things like drug screens and syringes, things like that. So again, sterile and used syringes versus dirty. Um, and then breathing emergency. So before we begin, it's helpful just to talk about how do we define opioids? What are opioids? And in my experience as a pharmacist, I, I have learned that a lot of people uh, might be consuming opioids and not even know it. Um, they're very commonly prescribed painkillers for a number of different conditions. Um, it could be um, things like, so pharmaceutical opioids are the things that are prescribed to you for maybe a surgery or pain for a procedure. So that could be things like um, oxycodone, hydrocodone, those are common. Uh, morphine is another one. Um, those are pharmaceuticals, those, so those can be prescribed. Then we have illegal opioids. Um, one of those would be um, non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. Um, fentanyl can also be a prescription, but the prescription form of fentanyl comes in a patch form. The illegal form, which is synthetic and made in labs, is non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. And this is a very, very potent drug, which means that a very, very tiny amount can kill somebody. And this has been the reason why we've seen a lot of overdoses within the last couple of years is because fentanyl has found its way into our drug supply. Um, and so people who never even want to consume an opioid, they might be methamphetamine users or cocaine users, they actually are um, passing away from overdose because there's fentanyl in their drug supply too and they don't even know it. And a lot of times people will say that they just trust their drug dealer, but even the drug dealers might not know that there's fentanyl in the drug supply. Um, so those are illegal opioids. And then heroin is also an opioid. Um, there's a whole bunch of street names here um, that you can see for different drugs. Um, long story short, I think the most important point is that, um, and oh, one other thing I, I like to bring up, um, opioids, um, so there's pharmaceuticals, but then there's a lot of um, pills on the market that look like pharmaceuticals, but they're actually manufactured with pill presses. So what some drug dealers are doing now is you can purchase pill presses online to make a pill that looks like just about anything. So they will purchase the pill presses and use some sort of powder. They often put fentanyl in these pills as well, and then they press them to look like a pharmaceutical. So we have people that are purchasing pills off the street thinking that they're getting a pharmaceutical when in fact it's not. Um, it's who knows what. Um, often it has fentanyl in it, and those have been responsible for a lot of deaths. And that actually is a really disturbing trend within youth right now where drug dealers are using um, social media platforms such as Snapchat to target our youth and sell them these um, fake drugs, basically, is what they're called. So there's some DEA advisories on that if you are interested in looking into them. So the signs and symptoms of opioid use and misuse include impaired memory or attention, constricted pupils, although that's not really the best one because the um, synthetics can actually cause dilated pupils. Someone might be scratching their skin, runny nose, nausea, sleepiness and nodding off, slurred speech, 
stupor and slowed breathing. So those are signs of use. And then really um, the signs of misuse, you know, the more opioids somebody consumes, the more you'll see slowed breathing, the more you'll see the slurred speech, and then eventually they will lose consciousness. So um, this is a little um, diagram that we like, uh, how to respond to an opioid overdose. So sometimes some of us like pictures more, I am one of them. So um, the signs of an overdose, um, somebody who is not responding, we can't move, um, move them, they're not moving, they can't be woken up. That is a really, really key sign that somebody is in trouble. Um, and then slow or no breathing or not breathing at all. So this is somebody who is not breathing at all or slower than every five seconds. Those are the two main symptoms that we are looking for when we're trying to determine if somebody should receive Narcan or Naloxone. Some other signs would be um, snoring, gurgling, or choking sounds. Uh, we can notice signs such as blue lips and nail beds and cold and clammy skin. Those are just the result of not getting enough oxygen. So whenever somebody's not getting enough oxygen, you're gonna start to see their color change. And then tiny pupils again, I think if you're experiencing um, or running across somebody experiencing an overdose, we're not going to spend the time to look at their pupils, to be honest. We're just going to look at those two things. Can we wake them up and are they breathing normally? And if the answer is no, then we would give them naloxone. And again, um, so we're, we're going to call 911 right away if we see the, uh, somebody with these two signs, the two major ones. Um, when we call 911, we want to say that we're calling to report an overdose. And you will not be charged with simple drug possession. Um, we're going to talk about that. Um, depending on your state's law. So in Minnesota, we have the Good Samaritan Law or Steve's Law, um, which we're going to talk about in this presentation. Other states have their own Good Samaritan Laws. So what is an opioid overdose? An opioid overdose occurs when an opioid by itself or more commonly mixed with other substances overwhelms the body's ability to handle it. So it really is individual specific. What would cause an overdose in me is probably different than what would cause an overdose in somebody who's used to taking opioids. So it really depends on if you're already accustomed or um, used to taking opioids. If you are, it would take more to cause an overdose for you. For me, I haven't had an opioid in um, probably years since I've had kids. So um, for me to take a, a dose of opioids, I'd be more likely to have an overdose if I'd never had it, depending on the dose. And when I say mixed with other substances, um, that means other painkillers, um, benzodiazepines. So those are anxiety drugs. They also cause sedation. So that combination is particularly deadly. Um, alcohol is another sedative where if we mix painkillers and alcohol, um, that can be really dangerous. Um, other drugs that cause sedation would be things like Ambien. People um, take Ambien for sleep or tranquilizers. Those also are very deadly in combination. And of course, fentanyl, which is widely um, found in our drug supply in any drug. So what leads to overdose death is basically respiratory failure. So when somebody consumes an opioid, um, it gets into the bloodstream, either no matter how you take the opioid, whether it be taken orally, you know, snorted, injected, doesn't matter, ends up in the bloodstream and basically um, crosses into the blood brain barrier and sits on these new opioid receptors, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, when it binds to those receptors, it basically turns down your body's desire to breathe or turns it off completely. So when your body is no longer getting that signal to breathe, you're not going to get enough oxygen in your blood. And then your vital organs like the heart and the brain start to fail. Um, so people lose consciousness. Um, they don't have normal breathing and this will lead to death. So really surviving an opiate overdose is all about breathing and oxygen. If you don't have naloxone, doing rescue breathing until help arrives would definitely help the person. Um, ideally, you'd be giving them naloxone as well. So this is basically what we're, um, how it works. And um, when we give somebody naloxone, we give them a second chance. So I'm gonna take a quick pause because I've been talking a lot. Um, I'm curious if anyone has any questions on anything I've covered so far before I start talking about naloxone specifically. There are no questions in the chat, but this is an opportunity to unmute and ask if you have a question or you can put it in the chat and I can read it as well. Okay, no questions. It's okay. It's like okay, we're going to move on then. Okay, um, so again, naloxone is a generic name for Narcan. Um, they are the same thing. Narcan is just the brand name. 
Um, and how it works, it's a high affinity mu receptor antagonist. So what does that actually mean? So earlier I um, shared how opioids end up um, causing respiratory depression, right? They end up in the bloodstream, they bind onto these mu opioid receptors. And when that opioid binds, it turns off your body's desire to breathe. When we give somebody naloxone, and whether we give it injectable or intranasal, if we give it intranasal, it gets absorbed in the tiny blood vessels in the nose. It also ends up in the bloodstream. And basically the naloxone binds more tightly to these receptors than the opioid does. So when the naloxone shows up in the bloodstream, it basically kicks those opioids off the receptors and binds in its place. It's kind of like a, a magnet. It has that tighter binding um, than the opioid. So the opioid gets released from the receptor, the naloxone binds in its place. Um, when the naloxone binds to those receptors, it doesn't send that same signal to the body to um, stop breathing or slow breathing. So when we give somebody naloxone early enough, it will basically kick the opioid off the receptor and the person's desire to breathe will come back. Um, so we might see them immediately start breathing. It might take a little bit of time, but we're gonna be looking for an increase in how often they're breathing and they might just flat out wake up. Now, the important thing is that the opioid is still there in the bloodstream circulating around. We don't have a drug that gets rid of the opioid. And the naloxone has a very short half-life. Um, that's how long it lives in the body. Um, naloxone is a very short half-life compared to the opioids. So the naloxone eventually is going to wear off within 30 minutes sometimes, and the opioid is still there. Now the opioid will bind back to that receptor and that person can experience another overdose. So that's why it's very important to call 911 and try to get this person into medical care so that this doesn't happen to them. Um, it's important that they never be left alone. We've heard of many people who um, their friends saved them from an overdose. They thought they were fine. They left them alone. And then um, they had another overdose and nobody was there to reverse it with naloxone. So that's an important point. Um, the, another important point is there's no dependence or tolerance to naloxone. And really the most important is that there's no clinical effects in the absence of opioids. So if we're wrong and we give somebody naloxone, maybe it's not an opioid overdose, right? Um, maybe it's something else that caused them to not be responsive and not be breathing normally. We're not going to do them harm because the only thing it does is sit on these receptors. There's a lot of drugs that can cause a lot of damage if we give somebody um, the drug and they don't need it. Um, if I was wrong and gave somebody epinephrine, maybe I thought they were having an anaphylactic reaction. I was wrong and I gave them epinephrine. That actually has systemic effects. Not so good. Um, with naloxone, that's not the case. It's a very safe drug. Because of that safety profile, it's actually been recommended by the FDA to be over the counter, and we'll be looking for that to happen this summer. Um, so it is a safe drug. Um, you should not be afraid of using it. And if you're wrong, you're not going to harm anybody. Laura, how long is the half-life? Um, the half-life of naloxone is um, 30 minutes to an hour, really depends. Um, the half-life of opioids is eight hours or more. Fentanyl in particular has a very long half-life. So we definitely, um, knowing that fentanyl is in our drug supply, absolutely have to keep an eye on that person because the naloxone will not last very long. So here's some different products. Um, we have the intranasal branded Narcan nasal spray. This is the one that is widely approved. It will be going over the counter. We have the injectable generic, um, and I will talk about both of those forms. We have the auto injector generic and branded Evzio, which is no longer on the market. It was pretty cool when it was here, but it was so expensive, nobody used it. And then the injectable generic given intranasally. Um, here's a picture of the Narcan nasal spray. Um, there's two different devices per box. And um, basically this is approved for adults and children of all ages. It's um, very easy, basically, um, this is what it looks like. And all you have to do is um, basically, I'm missing one device here, but basically there's a plunger and the plunger gets pushed in. And that's all we do, super simple. So when people have limited dexterity, I'm thinking of elderly people in particular, even children, um, if you have limited dexterity, all you have to do is push the plunger in, super simple. Um, it is more expensive right now. The best pricing I can get for it, my community member pricing is $47.50. Um, um, once it ends up being over the counter, um, hopefully it will still be covered by insurance. Right now it is. You can purchase it in the pharmacy. There's standing orders in place where you can go in and basically get this um, run through your insurance. So 
Um, it's a pretty, pretty good deal right now if you can get it through your insurance. Once it goes over the counter, we should be able to see it in gas stations and more widely available. Um, so again, what we're looking for is inadequate breathing or no breathing in an unresponsive person. We're going to spray the contents of one device into one nostril. And then we repeat with the second device and the other nostril after two to three minutes if there's minimal response or no response at all. And again, you can see there's a plunger, a nozzle. You basically just push the plunger in with your thumb. That's all you do. Um, one question in the chat. Will Narcan also help with an OD of xylazine? Unfortunately not. Um, so xylazine is an alpha-2 agonist. Um, it's a completely different class of drugs. So that is um, unfortunate that it will not help, I think. Um, so those two drugs have an interaction because they both cause sedation. That's why it's, a, a, again, another deadly combination. We don't have um, a drug right now that we can use for xylazine. So I think what we would do is if we don't know if somebody had xylazine or um, we don't know what they had, right? We're going to give them naloxone either way. And then we're going to continue doing rescue breathing. Um, and that's the best we can do as we call 911 and wait for help because um, what that person needs is oxygen. Um, we also have the naloxone intramuscular injection here. Um, so this is um, can be found in vials or ampules. Each kit contains two or three vials depending on the source. Um, this comes in a light proof bag like this. Um, I'm going to actually unblur my background for this so you can see how to do it. So um, this is what the syringe looks like here. It's got a lid on it. And then here's what the vials look like. So you can see there's a rubber stopper inside. Um, that's where the needle goes through. This is what it looks like before you pop the lid off. So when we get this, we're gonna pop the lid off, this orange lid as our first step. That reveals this little rubber piece in the inside, which is where the needle goes through. Um, so basically, again, it's the same thing as the other formulation. We're looking for somebody who's not breathing at all and non-responsive. We're gonna draw all the medication from this little vial and inject all of it, which is one milliliter, into the thigh or upper arm shoulder muscle. We're not going to worry about air in the syringe, and we're going to repeat in two to three minutes if there's minimal response or no response. So I'm just going to tilt my camera um, so I can show you how this works. If you are shaky in an emergency like me, um, that is why it went into pharmacy instead of medicine. I'm a little shaky, not a great person in emergencies. I'm going to set this down on a solid surface. So I'm going to show you how this looks. Okay, so I'm going to set my vial down right here. Here's my syringe. I'm going to pull off the lid set it over here where I can find it later. Um, I'm going to hold both of these and basically tip this little needle in and then flip it over and poke it in just a little bit. Then as I flip this over, you can see that the needle's at the bottom of the vial and that's where the liquid is too. And then I pull this plunger down. As I'm pulling it down, it's pulling all the liquid with it. So now I have all this liquid in my vial and that is when I'm going to inject the person into the arm so where you get your flu shot or into your thigh um, so your thigh most of us are probably sitting right now you would be injecting it um, into that muscle between the knee and the hip um, into those large muscles you can inject through light clothing um, probably not something like a carhartt jacket or a snowmobile jacket something thick like that so then once i've done the injection i'm going to show you we don't just want to go like this. We never want to recap a needle like this because it would be very easy to poke ourselves. So we're going to have that cap here, and we just put the um, scoop with a scooping mechanism. We get that cap right back on the needle like that, okay? And then if we have a sharps container, fantastic. That's where you're going to want to put it. If you don't have a sharps container, you'll just want to find like a plastic water bottle or pop bottle to put that needle in. Um, you also want to hang on to the vials. You might need to give the person a couple doses, right? Two or three doses. You're going to want to let the EMS, when they arrive, know how much you gave that person. Um, quick pause again. Any questions before we get into um, the other considerations for naloxone? I'm just scanning. Thanks for the, all the great comments in the chat. 
Let's see any questions. Does anyone have any that um, any questions they would like to? Oh, let's see. Will you cover um, galmaphene? If I'm saying that right, um, it has a quick, longer half life, but a very quick distribution phase. So N A L M E. Yeah, that's a new one. Um, we we haven't been covering that since it's not really widely used yet. But maybe at the end, um, we can take a quick. Once we're done with this and we stop recording, um, we can maybe have a conversation about that if somebody has some experience in working with it. Great. That would be great. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, COVID nineteen um, safety considerations. So these are special considerations that. Um, Basically, uh, <laughs> we added after COVID-19 just to make sure that we are being thorough. Um, so again, using personal protective equipment such as gloves and face protection, um, if, if we can, if possible, um, you want to position the person's head facing away from you. Um, this is because as they come to, they might cough. Um, and obviously, if they have COVID, you're going to not want to get that. Um, you want to administer the naloxone, of course, following instructions for use. You want to start other life support measures as trained. So that would be like rescue breathing because, right, um, oxygen is really what this person needs. Um, as they're regaining consciousness, you're going to step back to allow for that six-foot distance, arrange for follow-up care. When safe, remove your PPPE, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, washing your hands with soap and water or um, using alcohol-based sanitizer, and then change your clothing if contaminated. So these all kind of make sense. Um, as far as adverse effects, um, naloxone, like I mentioned, is a very safe drug. We don't expect adverse effects if there's, um, or any effects at all, if there's no opioids in the body. Um, there's product specific reactions. So if you give somebody the Narcan nasal spray, they could have nasal dryness. Um, if you give somebody the injectable, they could have an injection site reaction, much like a flu shot, your arm would be sore. Um, these I feel uh, are pretty minor compared to um, overdose, but we are being thorough. <laughs> um, they can elicit opioid withdrawal and precipitated withdrawal. So that means that somebody could be in a pretty unpleasant state very quickly. Um, so that's something to be aware of. It's a really people feel very sick, um, nauseous. So that can happen right away when you give them naloxone. We know that pulmonary edema has been reported with naloxone use, but it's also reported with opioid overdose. So it's really hard to tease apart if the pulmonary edema came from the naloxone versus the overdose itself. Um, and then rescue breathing and oxygen can limit the development of pulmonary edema. There are some special storage considerations for naloxone. We do want to keep them in their original package at room temperature. Um, we want to avoid exposure to light. Um, in particular, with this formulation, we need to keep it in the lightproof bag that it comes in because um, when it's exposed to sunlight, it degrades more quickly. We want to keep it in a safe place away from children and pets, not because we're worried about them being harmed, but simply because they can get into things and um, harm them or move them or chew on them, whatever. <laughs> um, so it, the best thing to do is to keep in a safe place where people can find it in case of emergency. Uh, we want to store both doses together because we don't want them to be um, separated. We might need that second dose. Um, as far as expiration, we want to check the expiration date on the package. Um, if it is expired, we can still use it to save somebody's life. We don't have to worry. Um, naloxone isn't one of those drugs that degrades into something that's dangerous. We've actually done studies and found that it lasts for many, many years beyond its expiration date, like 20 plus <laughs> years. So if you have expired naloxone and you have the opportunity to save somebody's life with it, we recommend that you do that. However, if you know that it's expired right now, we'd recommend that you swap it out for a new dose with the harm reduction agency. They are happy to take those expired doses and give you a new dose. Um, and then you're going to um, dispose of your drug, um, sorry, expose of your sharps at a drug return, return kiosks. Um, um, one thing I didn't state or need to talk about in more detail is we really want to keep this at room temperature. So naloxone um, should not be kept in cars, in Minnesota in particular. Our cars are exposed to very hot temperatures in summer and very cold in winter. Um, we know that any drug will degrade more quickly if it's exposed to temperature extremes. That is definitely the case with naloxone as well. Um, if it's frozen and brought back to normal temperature, it will likely still work. Um, but we do want to try to keep them um, at room temperature with us in our purse, backpack, whatever it is. Um, as far as special populations, um, we know that in pregnant people, it crosses the placenta and can precipitate withdrawal in the fetus. 
for neonates and can cause seizures in neonates born of those with opioid dependency. Um, again, the alternative for both of these is that the, both the mother and the fetus pass away. Um, lactation, we don't know if it's excreted in breast milk, but we already know that it's not absorbed orally, so that's not really a concern. And then in geriatric populations, as we get older, we just don't clear drugs as fast. Our kidney and our liver, they just don't work as well. And so any drug is going to have higher levels, um, including naloxone. Another quick pause. I see Mary Jo's <laughs> popping up. Is there a question? Yeah, so just about storing naloxone um, in a car, and you might have said this, but um, should she throw it away or is it better than nothing? Um, if it's been in your car for a long time, I would probably just, but best case scenario, I would just swap it out for a new dose. That's what I would do. Um, bring it to a harm reduction agency and let them know um, where it's been. They, they often take expired doses and give them to people that use them at high frequency along with other doses. So um, I would definitely just get a new one. <laughs> um, and then if, if you don't have a harm reduction agency to swap it out with, once you get your new one, then I would, would probably get rid of the other one because if it's been frozen all winter um, or multiple winters and been exposed to 120 degrees, it's probably not super effective, but hard to know for sure. Good question. The other question that was asked that I missed before from Tammy is that is one milliliter, so naloxone dosage, um, no matter the size of the person, um, or sometimes is there needed to have multiple doses? Yeah, the procedure is to just keeping just keep giving naloxone until EMS arrives or they wake up. So, um, and I should have mentioned that too, in rural areas where response time is longer for EMS, we recommend people take multiple multiple kits, right? So they might take two of these bags of two each. You might need to give somebody four doses. In some areas we're finding because of um, fentanyl in our drug supply, people might need up to 12 doses um, to get them to EM or get them to the hospital. So um, if you are in a rural area, we recommend that you have more than just the two doses. So that would be more than just one of these kits, more than one box. Um, with fentanyl in the drug supply too, I, um, you know, some naloxone is better than none, but I would just say that we're seeing that overdoses require more. So I think if you are in a rural area and you're in a rural area that you know has fentanyl, um, I would probably have more than one dose at home or wherever you're working, um, your workplace. Not good news, I'm sorry, but I'm just because of the need to be cautious. So there are some myths and misconceptions around naloxone. One of them is that it's a controlled substance. I think this is probably just because people think, well, that it works like an opioid, so therefore it must be controlled, and it's definitely not. I'm, I'll tell you that there's even healthcare providers. Um, I had a physician question me on this one recently, like, hey, shouldn't that be controlled? I'm like, nope, it's actually going to be over the counter soon. So, um, so these myths are not just limited to community members. Um, we also have the myth that there's going to be aggressive behavior after administration. This is just a myth. Can it happen? Yes. Um, it's very common for people to do what's called speedballing, and that's where you combine an upper and a downer. So that would be like taking cocaine, which is an upper, or methamphetamine, which is an upper. And then if that is laced with um, fentanyl, which is a downer, so opioids are downers, or heroin, right? So you're mixing things that are uppers and downers. If you take away the effect of the opioid, which is the downer, you're going to see the effect of the upper unmasked basically so you're going to see somebody on methamphetamine you're going to see somebody on cocaine um and then also when people wake up from an overdose sometimes they don't know what's going on and they might be surrounded by a crowd of, crowd of people they're probably scared they don't know what's going on maybe the police are there so um the aggressive behavior can it happen yes but is it always going to happen no um, there's also the myth of harm related to administration. Hopefully you understand why that's a myth now um, as you learn more about the pharmacology. Um, there's the myth that if you give somebody naloxone, you're going to just enable them. They're going to go out and use opioids because they have naloxone. And that is a myth. Unfortunately, this one's more common within the healthcare professional community. Um, it is not backed by data. Data does not support that, but people still believe that. Um, somebody who's experienced an overdose being reversed by naloxone will tell you that that nobody really likes precipitated withdrawal. It's not actually a state that you would seek. So um, that unfortunately is a myth that people are still buying into. And then there's a myth of liability as well. And I think that's because people don't know how it works. So a few additional clarifications. Naloxone saves lives. It's an effective opioid antagonist. It works if administered early enough for opioids. Again, not xylazine, unfortunately. 
um, and it's a harm reduction tool where opioid use occurs despite the consequences. Um, it allows people the opportunity to stay alive and seek treatment. Um, we do have some laws. I know not everyone's from Minnesota, but um, each state has its own laws, so it's important to know what your laws are in your state. In Minnesota, we have um, a couple different branches of our laws. So we have the authority to possess and administer opiate antagonists for non-healthcare professionals. Then we have a branch for healthcare professionals. So this is basically that um, you um, can administer, dispense, I'll, I'll actually go to the community one first. So a non-healthcare professional acting in good faith can possess or administer an opiate antagonist, that's naloxone, that is prescribed, dispensed, or distributed by a healthcare professional and be immune from criminal prosecution. Again, why do we have this? Um, so people feel safe giving it, right? So what could actually happen? I, I suppose um, if you weren't trained in naloxone and you gave somebody the injectable in the wrong location, right? So there's people that think um, if they're not trained, like maybe I should give it in the neck. No, we would not. <laughs> not try to give it in the neck, right? We don't want to do it through the chest wall. Like there, there are things that could go wrong if you're doing it wrong, right? But if you're following the directions, giving it to them in the arm or large muscle, you're not going to hurt them. Um, or if they get an injection site reaction, that is why we have this law. So then there's also, also one for healthcare professionals. We also have Steve's law, which is our opioid specific Good Samaritan law. So this is for the person seeking medical assistance so that they are immune from prosecution. So if I'm using drugs with my friend and they experience an overdose, I can call 911 and not be charged with um, sharing, possession, use of a controlled substance. Now the one, um, the one exception to this is if you have a felony on your record. We did learn if you have a felony on your record, this does not apply to you. They can still charge you. Um, so again, in the event of an overdose, what do you do? First, try to stay calm. Then you want to call 911 right away. Um, give them naloxone. Um, follow those instructions. When they wake up, explain what happened as they may not know. Um, tell them the sick feeling will go away when the naloxone wears off. And then encourage them to go to EMS. And then we want to give EMS those empty naloxone containers. And then if you do end up reversing somebody's overdose, it's really important to debrief and get support. So again, here's a visual, kind of the same thing that we've um, been talking about. We're looking for somebody who is not responsive and not breathing well, um, so that's slower than every five seconds, or not breathing at all. They might have some of these other signs and symptoms too, like snoring, gurgling, or choking sounds. They might not look good. They might look kind of blue. Call 911 right away. You're going to tell them what you're responding to. Um, you can try to wake them up again, like stimulate them, check their airway. Um, if you're trained in rescue breathing, giving them a couple rescue breaths is always a good idea. Um, if they're still not breathing, then you give them naloxone. And you're going to put them in that recovery position, which you can see. This is basically laying somebody on their arm, on their side, um, propping them up like this um, so that if they do come to and they vomit, we don't want them to choke on their vomit. So, um, so then we're going to wait for EMS to arrive. And there's a couple links we have here, too, um, that kind of review these steps. Um, there's some state and national resources you might find helpful. So in Minnesota, we have the Department of Health Opioid Dashboard. There's a SAMHSA National Helpline here. Um, poison control is always a good resource. Um, here is my contact information. I'll leave this up for a little bit here in case you want to send me an email. Um, I'm at the College of Pharmacy in Duluth, so lpalumbi at d.umn.edu. Um, we do have an evaluation link, which I know um, Mary Jo and I can put in there uh, in the chat. We'd appreciate it if you don't mind evaluating us. It always helps us to improve our presentations. We also have um, a um, um, certificate. If you need a certificate that you did this training. Um, and then here's another link too, um, in case you want to search for other webinars. So we do these webinars. Um, we have another one on harm reduction. Um, kind of a general introduction to harm reduction that we just did yesterday. We do that pretty regularly. Um, we have those recorded as well, if that's easier for you. And then we have other events on this website here. So I'm going to stop sharing now. We're going to open it up for more questions.